Hi, everybody. Well, we'd love to welcome you here well, to Read Science. I'm Joanne, and my co host is Jeff Schomeyer. And our guest today is Mary Roach, uh, the New York Times bestseller of Stiff and Spook and Bonk and Packing for Mars. And her latest book is Gulp. Uh, which I hope most of you have managed to go out and get. And so this is uh, Adventures on the Alimentary Canal. Uh, really glad to have you here, Mary. Oh, happy to be here. Nice to be here. Hello, everybody. It's great. Well, that's the thing. i got to figure out how to get extra people, but not too many. I think there's a maximum of 10 you could invite. But uh -huh, uh -huh. I, when I've done things like this, I've had people who've turned on their music and then they're always prominent, like whoever's making the most noise is the prominent on the screen. <laughs> oh, is just, that how it works? Yes. I, I think there's a way I to just, control. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. There's a way I could control who's who's up, but um, yeah, so that that's just more than I need to learn in the first time around, right? It's so. experimental, as you said. Yes. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about your book because, of course, I'm a biologist, and yes. uh, you... Uh, your, most of your books focus on biology, on human biology. Um, yeah. Did you find this one any more challenging or uh, less so? Um, this one was, well, there are certain areas. That I, I'm definitely, because I don't have a background in biology, I'm a little um, limited in what I can really delve into. So I'm, um, it, yeah, there was at one point where I thought, oh, maybe I'll explore the the um, the mind gut connection. And so I downloaded a forty page paper, and I thought this is just way beyond what I can process and turn into something that fits in this book. So I, I, I that, it was there were a couple areas that were yeah a little challenging for someone like me that you weren't weren't quite ready to delve into. So your your book follows sort of down the elementary canal from your mouth all the way to the end. So, nose to tail. Yep, nose to tail. So what would you say was your, uh, the most, I don't know, let's start with the most interesting uh, as far as the people you met and the information right. you discovered. Well, I it, always uh, find it fascinating to discover the, that there are entire <coughs> fields of science that I've never heard of, like the science of oral processing, that there's people who study uh, bolus formation in the mouth and the physics of chewing and uh, saliva. I spent a, a day with a woman who in the Netherlands and a beautiful beautiful Italian woman and what she does is study saliva and uh, so I, I find it fascinating because they take you to a, a whole other level with regard to the subject matter but also I just love spending time with somebody who's, who's made their life work something that most of us just take completely for granted and don't give any thought to so it was kind of uh, so that in, in itself was a lot of was pretty interesting and surprising and uh, just you know it's, it is great that's one of my favorite things is to talk to people you know who've discovered their passion and have yeah. made new discoveries because of that right right uh, especially when it's something like saliva you know if somebody's passion <laughs> is spit <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it was it was a good chapter actually I remember that one I remember them all physical scientists are like that I'm a physical scientist and you just it, it's pretty unpredictable sometimes what will turn people on you go oh wow cool we can measure the viscosity of spit yeah yeah <laughs> exactly since yeah. Mary brought it up and I had read elsewhere um, and thinking about I just finished reading Bonk which I enjoyed very much thank you and I've also read Spook and Stiff some uh, back when they were newer but somebody, you told somebody that you, humanity or human topics were a theme of yours. And whether that's, it does seem to be true. And the question that came to mind for me was whether that was something that you started out with or whether that was a theme that, you know, you looked back and said, oh, I keep choosing these human things. And along with that, when I was reading Bonk, I thought, Hmm. Is it really the the frequent absurdity of the human condition that <laughs> attracts you to yes. so many good stories to tell? Yeah, I I think it is the absurdity and the surrealness sometimes of the human condition, and and the fact that you know we are ultimately just animals like any other animal. We're digesting and excreting and mating, and but we try very hard to think of ourselves as something higher and loftier. We tend to think of ourselves as 
personalities and minds. And, and then, but we can't escape the fact that we're these biological creatures. And I, I guess that's part of what I find fascinating. Um, and I'm also, the reason, I guess part of the reason I cover the things that I do cover is I like to be, you know, I'm a little bit antiquated when it comes to science. A lot of science today is, is going on on a not just microscopic, but molecular genomic level. So that's, that's not stuff you can go to a lab and see people doing things. Uh, I mean, you can see them doing things, but a lot of it's taking place in, uh, you know, uh, beneath the microscope or in, even invisibly. You can't really share it with the reader in the same way that you can somebody who's in a lab um, chewing on a plug to absorb spit and then centrifuging the plug to get the sal saliva out and then, you know, taking it when taking a pipette and, and actually doing science as, as I was taught it as a, a, a kid. So... I'm kind of li I, I, I'm inhabiting a world of science that is is a little bit rare these days. Uh, well, but yeah. you're writing for non-scientists who have right. a whole world to catch up on that they don't know about that yeah. is microscopic and takes place on the lab top and things. Right. And old science is fine with me because my yeah. field when I was researching was all thermodynamics, which the modern kids all think of as as terribly uh, white haired. And <laughs> but there are, are so many good stories already to tell about things that people don't know about. And this yeah. is a thing that Joanne and I will touch on is inviting people to find out about science. And there's, there's plenty of stories there. Yeah. Yeah. I think of myself, I guess, I'm, in some sense, I'm sort of a gateway drug to yeah. science. Um, I, I, uh, and hopefully not leading people astray, like they look how fascinating science is, and then they decide to major it. And then, but I think that I think that once that the further that you go with science, you know, you become fascinated on that deeper level, on that molecular level, and you know that fascination will stay with you. Hopefully, um, yeah. that's exactly right. And and at least one of my things, but Joanne hears this from me all the time, is. <clears throat> Any any story is is interesting that that attracts people's attention, and then you know so tell that story. But the the vital thing is don't mistell the science. Don't say something wrong or misleading or right. stupid. You know, try to include the science as a cultural aspect, as a natural part of the story. But please, 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 pay some attention to getting it right. And yeah. It may not go without saying that we're talking to you because, thankfully, you tell these interesting stories, but you get the science right, and I think that's <laughs> that's the way it should be, and that's yeah. very commendable too. But I think that does a very valuable service for for non scientists. Yeah, I, I'm glad to hear that because you, you know you sometimes there's there's two sides to the debate. There's there are there are people who feel that it sort of that it trivializes that humor trivializes the science, or that it um, you know by by not I mean I. I, I try very hard to get it accurate, but I am presenting a fairly simple view of whatever it is. I, I because it, I, just because of the nature of the books and um, the audience that they're for. But um, yeah, but it, it's very nice to hear that from you. Yeah. Sure. Well, <laughs> attracting their attention and uh, fostering their interest without selling them snake oil is is right. a great thing. Yeah. And, right. and it does that. So do you have, I would assume the answer is going to just be yes, but uh, maybe describe, you ever have a troll who comes and says, well, you just presented this all wrong, and um, or, or do you do okay because you go right to the, peop, you know, the specialist in spit, right? So if you're to her, then you know you're getting it right, or do you have someone who insists on saying, well, you know, you should you have done somebody it this that way. I've gone to to interview. You mean no, or? no, but maybe someone who's read your book and then decided to come tell you how you got something wrong. Oh, uh, um, very, very rarely. Um, good. Yeah. Um, you, and usually, when people write to me, it's and usually when I have something wrong, it's some nugget of military <laughs> history, <laughs> or um, I'm trying to think of things. Or the fact that the person jogging in 2001 is not Keir Delay, it's Gary Lockwood. <laughs> so it's, it's, more, it's more often that kind of thing than you got this all wrong. I think because I'm, I'm reporting such very finely focused episodes of science and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to take on uh, all of digestion or even uh, how the stomach works. It's, I, I get caught up in like, wow, could... 
could someone survive? You know, to, as a way to talk about the stomach, I looked at, you know, could someone survive like Jonah? And then I went further on, like, could anybody? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Let me just get that. That's fine. Hello. Sorry, I'm doing a, a Google Hangout. I have to go. Ninety. Okay. That's awesome. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry about I that. Like that's that my husband answer. saying, "How much do we pay the cleaning lady?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, where was I? Uh, oh, anyway, uh, I'm usually oh the Jonah, and then I was wondering, is there any creature that could survive? Which got me to that wonderful historical chapter, uh, historical dis discussion of. Um, stomach snakes and frogs and the belief that uh, people had that there was something living inside them that they really believed that because they interpreted they didn't know what was going on they interpreted the feelings of the normal motions of the digestive tract as there's something living in me and then I went, took that further to uh, that rumor on the internet that mealworms can eat their way out of the stomach of a lizard so you know because I'm, I'm so I'm on this little narrow road it's not it's pretty easy to get things right so um, you know I'm not I'm not covering a topic very very broadly and trying to I mean I, I think I couldn't I, I would really need to have a, a background in science in whatever science I was so but I, I do from time to time get somebody saying you know you're contributing to scientific illiteracy by simple by not explaining things thoroughly or whatever you know you get every now and then someone who needs a hug <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Now, I well, and I'm an advocate. Well, both Jeff and I are just like getting people interested in science, and of course, I like accuracy. But I love your books, and I think you know they they serve a wonderful purpose. Uh, you know, you're a bestseller, right? You you've right, sold right. so well, many I books. You do better than a yeah. lot of the science writers out there. Yeah. So uh, because you precisely because you have the humor and because you come to it from a viewpoint of someone who wants to know as well. Right, right, yeah. right. So uh, I, I like uh, how you discussed, uh, yeah, what happens to chewing gum. Yeah, it goes all the way through, folks. Yeah. You know what I mean? If, if nothing else, people know this, or maybe yeah, right. that watermelon is not going to grow in your stomach if you swallow a seed. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, when all is said and done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so right. It's there. If, you tell, uh, if you tell the stories with... with some precision and accuracy, but make them interesting. Don't get, don't get wrong. Whatever comes up, and don't try uh, too hard to keep the science out of the way because that might terrify people. I can't see. I think it's all to the good. Yeah, I mean, I try to use the narrative framework, sort of to have a, a scaffolding or, a, or a, yeah, just a frame to hang the facts that, so that people will, you know, they'll be, they'll come into their minds in a in the context of a story which I think makes it easier to learn or, or a more appealing way to, to to learn something to have it in a a broader story as now, it were you know. while we're sort of close to that I had another question written down that <clears throat> everybody who writes about your books talks about talks about says ah oh, she does this with great humor and things which is an I think is a nice thing to say about people it's it's good to yeah. have a light touch and not be not be as dull as scientists sometimes can be, but there's there's a difference between uh, well I can imagine a difference between telling telling things as a series of jokes and simply finding good and interesting and cultural and illuminating stories that are just absurd. Yeah, when, right. When you right. talk about them, and I think that's yeah. a lot of where that comes from. And do you yeah. plan that? Does that just happen? Do you use your intuition? Do you have some rules now about yeah. how to how to handle the so-called humor aspect? Or? Uh, you're absolutely right. It's not the humor in the books is not generated by me trying to be like a, a, a comic. I'm not generating yep. lines. Well, every now and then, but it's much more. Uh, I'm I'm looking for situations that are going to be somewhat absurd or surreal. For example, you know, putting myself. Uh, and sometimes it's just the, the the vast gap between 
my knowledge and the knowledge of like there's a there's in in bomb uh, no in spook there's this guy who's a, he studies consciousness theory and he's he's just going and he's speaking in a in a very very advanced degree kind of way and I'm struggling to understand you know quantum mechanics basically and and the humor in that chapter comes from the two of us trying to actually have a conversation and it's one of my favorite chapters uh, and one of the it was you know I was just struggling to just present it in a way that I wouldn't completely lose people with the science but also I wanted them to understand the basic principles it was a, a, the soul weighing chapter and he was sort of a modern day Duncan McDougall, the guy who tried to put dying people on a scale. But um, anyway, so yeah, it's the it's the situation, the kind of the the absurdities of of being these biological creatures and studying them. And and of course, Bonk was full of that kind of situation because you're bringing human yeah. beings into a lab and having them be sexual and trying to study that. And that's of course so awkward. It's that almost all absurd. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So, so, so very much that I'm, I'm the way I'm, I'm consciously looking for uh, situations that, and I never know till I get there. But I'm looking for situations where the humor and the humor. I don't want it at the expense of the scientists. I don't want it at the expense of the science. Just the the juxtaposition of science and spit or whatever whatever it is. The humor comes from. It's a. It's a. It's, it's a subtle humor. It's not like yuck, yuck kind of yeah. um, guffaw humor, really. Yeah. Let, let me revisit a question I asked you a few years back. So I, I'll preface all of this saying I drove five hours to meet Mary Roach <laughs> and hang out with her all day at a biomechanics symposium. And, and actually, before I go on to revisit the question, uh, I, I learned from you, Mary, the most interesting thing that you know I hold on to this day when I'm communicating is we were sitting there and we were watching a graduate student probably at her very first symposium presenting her research and she's going and going and going and you lean over and you go this is a little dry isn't it and I thought and I stopped and I went yeah I guess it is and then I realized us science people are made of really tough stuff because we, we don't care how you're dressed, we don't care if it's amusing, we don't care if it's engaging. We're just sitting there going, we're going to grab this material and analyze it based solely on the material. Right. So we're not trying to always engage and entertain. Right. And so I was like, oh, wow, we, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I've just held on to that since. Yeah, but you shouldn't, ha you shouldn't have to as scientists entertain. You know, right. I, I, it's enough of a burden to 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 do the research, to do it well, and present it to a group. I don't think you should. Anybody should feel obligated to be have snazzy slides or be witty and entertaining. I just think that's way more than any scientist has time for, or you know, should have to worry about. You know, right. so. Yeah. Well, that was a fun day, and at the yeah. end of it, I did uh, interview you, and I remember I had asked if uh, people would turn in questions, and one question came from Carl Zimmer, and his question was, is there anything you cannot make funny in yeah, science? And I remember your answer were things that were broader and over a long time scale or very specific, like molecular biology or maybe the weather or maybe, uh, yeah. yeah geology. Uh, do yes. you still find that to be true? Oh, or? very much, very much. I think um, I think Jeff really hit the nail on the head when he said it's the human condition, <clears throat> the science of the human condition. Whether even, even Packing for Mars is really a book about this sort of surreal challenges of taking an organism that evolved in Earth gravity and trying to make it function in zero gravity where nothing works right. Uh, and all of the shenanigans and plannings and, and wreath reconfiguring that goes on toward that goal is fascinating so it is so um, that's that's really where my, my, um, where my where I'm focused and where most of the humor comes from so if, if yeah most I would say most of science I could not really make I couldn't make it funny uh, astronomy doesn't strike me as particularly funny physics because it's so it's so abstract, and someone like me, there, there's humor in someone like me trying to understand it uh, and present it. But um, 
But yeah, uh, um, and anything, anything in, in uh, genetics would be well. Genetics says genetics has some really surreal stuff going on now. So I think you know you can th there could be some fun to be had there. But uh, but you know you don't want it to be forced. That's the other thing. But I think you yeah. found you have found uh, a good secret for how to do this with your with your interest in human stories is that microbiology it may be hard to make it entertaining or something but stories about microbiologists trying to do microbiology especially when it sounds like some stupid yeah. topic can be very entertaining and scientists for for no little reason have a, have a, a reputation for being eccentric and you can you can yeah. make that into good stories and yeah. still and that conveys the science along with it yeah, yeah, very much so. Oh, microbiology can be very fun. Microbiology is, I think microbiology, well, yeah. And people are, are fascinated with particularly the human microbiome, this notion that they have inside them, this whole community, this whole universe of little creatures. Uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a topic. I know, and Carl does such a beautiful job with it. Uh, and, and I always admire, I mean, Carl has a... Uh, you know, uh, he's got a, a very devoted following, and he, he doesn't necessarily have to make it funny. You know, he just makes it real and makes it fascinating. I mean, he's just, he, he I mean, I, I, I am in awe of people who can write books without sort of, I mean, I, I don't, not like the crutch of humor, but um, it's how I do it. But I, if I didn't have that, I think that the book, my books would fall flat. I don't think they maybe, would do very maybe well. Maybe not. It seems like either. Um Humor or uh, enthusiasm seem to be the yeah, vital yeah. component. Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh. definitely. Yeah. Well, there was a shoot. There was a question that was coming on right at the end of that, and I've forgotten it. Oh. oh. Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure it was the best question of the whole day. Um, <laughs> it'll come back. Yeah. Just I let it go. Set it aside. It'll come back. <laughs> don't you think? Don't you like think? Like Mary's little lamb. Yeah, sometimes, you come home. You know, you're you're saying, well, I can't do this because I'm not a scientist, and this I work. But do you really about being really worry about not being a scientist? Isn't part of your a part of uh, what you do here, and part of the the natural humor, the understanding, and conveying enthusiasm and information? The fact that you're not a scientist and things look absurd to you that would not look absurd maybe to me and Joanne. Yes, that's true. That's true. I don't think I could do. I couldn't. I couldn't write the books that I write if I had a background. And I notice even from the tar the time I begin a project uh, to the when I've been in in it for a, a year or so, and it starts to seem more normal. And it does like the humor things that would have struck me as funny maybe at the beginning or 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 strange or surprising. You know, I'm starting already to you know be used to the material. So. It is the newness of it and the surprising, the surprises that, that I encounter when I'm first stepping into that world. That's where a lot of the, the, the humor and surprise comes from. So I, I, I couldn't do what I do without being ignorant. No, we're <laughs> Starting so, out we, ignorant, yeah. We, we read a lot about your raised eyebrows in these, these encounters that, that you describe. <laughs> In that process, it was a sort of technical note, but in that process, as you're doing research, there's sort of two questions I'm interested in. One is, how, how much do you start out knowing that you want to do, uh, address a particular type of research, you know, talk to the people who, who use the test tubes to do particular things, for instance, and how, how much of it comes along while you're doing that, and then... Yeah. As you're doing the research, where in there do you start to feel that your table of contents, your series of topics, yeah. starts to become something you can work with? Yeah, that's a great question. I start out, I, I do, I have an idea, a very broad idea of what I might cover in a book, and I almost always stray from that because when I realize what's really out there and how this science works and, and what the possibilities are, I realize that the things I had imagined exist either don't exist or they're not that interesting. So um, I'm, as I go along, every new, every new lab I go to, I, I'll, I'll learn about someone else or something else. So, so it's very much evolving. Over the, per, the first six months, I'd say, I'm constantly jettisoning, oh, I thought I was going to do this, and now I'm not. So there's always five or six folders in my file cabinet of things I, 
uh, you know, a dead ends. I thought I was going to go pursue that, but it turned out there's something more interesting or more relevant. Uh, and it, it's not a, for at least six months or more. Uh, I don't, I don't have the outline, the table of contents, but I'd say around. That's about the span of time where I start to realize, okay, I think I have a sense of the lay of the land and where I'm going to go, and how that will fit with where I've been and what that, you know, what the table of contents will be. And that's a very comforting knowledge to know, you know, this is what I have left to fill in, and this is what I've done. But I don't have that at the beginning at all. You know your process now, so you can be more yeah. confident about that. But you start out by following your nose, yeah. and, Fair, yeah. and a shape comes along from from what you find, right? Yeah, which would it, it, it makes it tough if you you know if you're somebody's first book and they want to present a very thorough book proposal. Um, if, if that my book proposal for Stiff, my first book, uh, I'd say at least half the things in that book proposal are not in the final book because I really I didn't I was writing from absolute ignorance, just having poked around a little bit on the internet and uh, done a little a couple of stories in the past that I that related. So I had a very sketchy sense of what was out there in the world, so um, uh, I ended up, but fortunately editors don't take your proposal and compare it side by side with your uh -huh. book when you're done. So when you're actually writing, so I'm not a writer and you won't catch me honing my skills as a writer <laughs> at any time. I mean, I write sufficiently, I do what I need to do. But um, So do you find yourself that you have to block off a certain amount of time to write? Or do you just sort of like, oh, I just, you know, I talked to her, this was fabulous, and you're sitting in your hotel room at night just mm. writing? No, I'm, I'm uh, I, I don't start to write until I have uh, all the material I would need for a chapter. So even if I've gone to interview somebody, spend time with them in the field, uh, I wouldn't until I have the because there's typically a lot of other research background or some historical that has to be done. So until I have all of that, I don't start writing. So I don't I, I and when I do, as soon as I have everything I think I need, then I start. Then I do start to write because I don't like it to get too stale uh, if I can avoid it. So it's when the material is ready to be written that's when I start writing it. And I assume you'll have overlap. You'll be visiting one expert, mm -hmm. and while you're trying to still research on yeah. that, and then you'll have to zip over to someone else's yeah. lab and and interact. Yeah, there. I'm always doing research at the same time as I'm writing, and uh, and a lot of what I end up doing is 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 emailing strangers and and trying to um, insert myself into their busy life and uh, let them know what I'm doing and hope that they'll have something interesting coming up in the next six months that I could come and. Uh, see and, or be involved in, so that a lot of my time is is just pestering scientists. <laughs> well, this must be so much easier now that you have several books under your belt, right? Yeah. Than I can imagine when you first wrote Stiff. Yes, yes, definitely. It's nice to get somebody to go. Oh, I've read one of your books, and sure, I would love to have you come here. That's so much easier than what What are you doing? And what kind of book is that about cadavers? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so you feel like each chapter comes at about the time when you're, uh, you have a story of discovery to present more than when you've finally reached an understanding of something, and that's what keeps it fresh for you. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I, I have all the pieces for that chapter. Right. And, and sometimes that I don't exactly know where it will fit in the book. Usually I have a pretty good sense, but sometimes it may get shifted <clears throat> around, but um, that, that's, that's okay. I just I want to write it while it's relatively fresh. What do, what do you think makes the uh, and I, I don't want this to be a you know where do your book ideas come from but chapters or books what do you think provokes your ideas or plants the seeds or something is it is it an anecdote is there a <laughs> fact that comes along and I'm sure it's going to be a mixture but yeah what what, what catches your interest and becomes something that you can turn into something bigger and, and that's still yeah. interesting. Well, the, the one that, the example that um, answers the question in a way that doesn't apply to every, every book uh, is Bonk, which was really a situation where I had, there was one moment where I read a sentence in Film Quarterly, of all things, 
and it was about Masters and Johnson and the films that they made. Yes, bonk. <laughs> Thank you. A little visual aid. Yes. Uh, so they talked about the colposcopic films of Masters and Johnson. And I went, is that mean like some, cervix? What is that? That's some sort of in, internal movie that, and I looked them up because I thought, really? Uh, and in fact, they did uh, films with a with a camera in a phallus that women would have come in and have intercourse with. And it was at that moment that I learned that I thought, duh, sex research. That's my next book. It was just boom. I know, and I know that I knew that my publisher would be delighted. I knew it wouldn't be a problem to sell this book. So it was one sentence in um, a journal. Not a medical journal even. So uh, sometimes it's easy like that. Other times I have a cluster of things that I think would be fun to write about and I think, well, what would be the umbrella topic? Like mm -hmm. Gulp was a situation where I had a few things that over the years I'd had fun with but couldn't really explore very much uh, for the magazine piece. So I kind of looked at those and thought, oh, well, this is kind of an obvious Mary Roach territory. I don't know why I never thought of covering the whole um, elementary canal. So that that was really just well. I'd like to write about that and that and that and what encompasses these. Oh, okay, yeah. So that, yeah. So uh, now, given Jeff and I had uh, run our kids read science and teens read science uh, contests a few years back, and and sort of took our theme of our uh, hangouts here, read science. I, I would like to ask if you wouldn't mind sharing, like, what did you read when you were uh, young? Uh, oh, it, sure. Was any of it science at all, or did you? You were just so um, reading. I read. I loved Tintin, those uh, which I guess were the early, early graphic novels. Uh, Tintin. I loved Harriet the Spy. I loved the, the Black Stallion series, um, the Narnia books. Um, I'm trying to think if there was any science. I got Weekly Reader, which I don't know if there was much science in Weekly Reader. As a little kid, I was in. Sec that was like fourth grade. It's for inquiring, inquiring minds. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, highlights for children. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know that there was, I don't think that the genre of kids' science books was as rich as it is now. I don't, maybe I'm wrong. Do you remember no, a lot no. of? I was going to say, when I was young, even as a teen, if I wanted science, it was Scientific American. I mean, you're, yeah. you're going to get that from. Yeah, you know, a, pres a prescription. Yeah. A subscription. Everything yeah. should be prescribed scientifically. Yeah. It almost uh, was a prescription. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. So, it, but now, you know, even it, when I was raising uh, my kids and still raising, but like even for very young kids, there are these amazing books about science. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, you know, it's just, it's great. So, what well, are you. We, we, we did have them. That we had series of time life books I can remember That's being right. for instance. That's right. And um, they did a spectacularly good job. And I think there's always been uh, something but but they they tend to be hidden. You know what I you know what I read uh, because my parents got Reader's Digest, there was this series, I am Joe's colon. <laughs> I am Jane's I am Jane and it was it was a big deal when they did I am Jane's ovary, I am Jane's breast. Wow. That was like, it was like ten years into the series when they finally get their nerve up to do Jane's <laughs> breast because it might be pornographic. But those I remember sitting, you know, because it was always in the bathrooms. So I remember, I would always read the I Am Joe's heart or whatever it was. So I think that was that is something I remember. The Reader's Digest series, <laughs> I Am Joe's that's, Brain. <laughs> that's you've given me a great lead in for a couple questions that I had written down, and as so you know that I was reading Bonk. And there were a couple of things. I was I was in your uh, in the introduction very early before you answered the question, and I'm thinking I'm wondering how you decided how you settled on what kind of vocabulary you were going to use to describe yeah, yeah. the sex research and all of this. And then you said, well, you use the the Lily and Phoebe test. <laughs> yeah. And it's like so. Then part of the question is, did that really take care of it? It's a good story, but is that where you did it? And then the other part is now that you've gotten to the end of that book, do you feel differently about talking about some of these things now that you've written about them and gone on tours right. and things? That's a sort of that's a transformative experience, and uh, I say that from experience from some of the things that I write about yeah. and knows, but I do fiction. 
yeah. but but the things that you write about give you give you a, a, an experience that that changes you. Yeah. You oh, yeah. You write your books. Yeah. Well, um, to answer the second part first, yeah. The uh, you, if you spend a few weeks on the road talking, well, even before I, I went on the book tour. Just having to be interviewing people who research sexual physiology, you are you are constantly saying orgasm, clitoris, vagina, masturbation. It, it you say it so much that the, the electrical charge disappears from those words, yeah. and it's like talking about polishing the silver. Really, it's not or anything. It it just becomes and because it long ago these words ceased to have any. Um, charge to them for the researchers they're very comfortable talking about it so you become comfortable and then in turn I think your audience starts to become you, you, you talk to a group of strangers about sex and it, there's something kind of liberating for them you find you know the first person is a little shy to raise their hand and then once one person asks a, a, a fairly explicit sexual physiology question a lot of hands go up and it's sort of I think people feel kind of freed to say things that they didn't have a setting in which to say them before. So uh, it, it was not, uh, it just, it came naturally over the course of writing the book. The first part of your question though, what words to use, was tough because, um, yeah, I don't think I used, I think I used the word bonk once in the book. I didn't, um, I don't use a lot of slang in the book, not because I'm anti-slang, but I just, um, my only concern is that there are not a lot of synonyms. There are not a lot of other ways to say penis. <laughs> you know, there's not don't you think, a lot don't of... Don't you think a lot is served by using a straightforward language? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I much prefer to use straightforward language than a, a, a... Not even a euphemism, but sort of just for variety's sake, I wanted to mix it up a little bit to stop saying the same word over and over, but there's not a lot of, a lot, a lot of good choices, and I didn't want something, you know... A romance novel euphemism would be yeah. horrible or dreadful, um, and I didn't want I didn't want a lot of you know s street talk either. Right. wasn't really appropriate. So so there's a lot of just the actual word itself. And I love I love one of the things I love in science is, is the terminology. Like some of the words, uh, like borborygmi, I learned this word for gulp, which is, has to do with that's the intent the sounds of rumblings of the intestines. Borborygmi. Yeah. I love that word, and and just the fact that somebody came up with a a word for this biological phenomenon is one I love. I am always enchanted by that. I have a I have a story I'm working on where I a, a book where I will use the word. So I wanted to thank you particularly for teaching me the word tele clitoridienne. <laughs> to find that for the audience. Uh, it's it's in the book, and uh, if you look it up, in bonk, yeah, yeah, in it bonk. has to, it has to do okay. It has to do with the difference, but uh, the distance between the clitoris and oh, what was the particular measure from? Well, it's essentially the clitoris to the the opening of the vagina, but she oh, used yeah. the um, uh, the I think she might use the urethra for some reason, but she was trying oh. to get at the, the the some some women have a their clitoris is very close to the opening of the to the vagina, and others it's very distant. Yeah. And she had, oh, this is this is uh, Mrs. Bonaparte who had the, yes. the theory that was basically seemed to be correct that how how likely it was for the woman to be stimulated at the clitoris during vaginal sex had a lot to do with whether she that had distance. an orgasm and her pleasure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Finishing up this idea for me, when you talk to people about not just bonk, but some of your other topics come at least close to some taboo sorts of things. Yes. Re researching on dead people and things is a little queasy for some people. Yeah. Do you get feedback that tells you people are finding it sort of a refreshing release that you're letting them you're you're letting them in on things that were mysteries before and now they can understand and that makes them less mysterious and they you also give them. Um, Leave to talk about some of these things. Yeah, that they need need an excuse to talk about. Yeah, I yeah I do get that feedback from time to time, and stiff in particular. When that book came out, I was concerned. I didn't want because because there's humor in the book, and it is a book that deals with dead bodies and therefore death. Even though it's not a book about death per se, um, or loss or grieving, it's a book about what happens. At, it's post mortem careers is more what, what the book's about. <laughs> Uh, I worried that the humor might 
uh, offend some people or make them, yeah, offend them. But it, but I've received a, a, a fair number, well, it, probably ten at least, uh, letters, emails from people saying that it was strangely comforting to have somebody talk in a straightforward way about what happens to the body at death. And by demystifying it, anytime you can demystify something that's sort of kept behind closed doors, uh, you know, it gives some, it's almost like you know, getting closure by getting the remains of a loved one. It's not, it's hard to say why that has that effect, but it, but just facts, just giving people some facts is a very comforting thing and it gives them permission they they can they then can talk about it comfortably and um, yeah so that that's been gratifying to hear from people from people who have been reading the book sometimes or when around the time they lost someone and that's what I was worried about that someone would pick this book up and have just uh, had an experience with the death of someone they love and found the book to be upsetting and I, I didn't want that and so it's been great when somebody's had the opposite experience with it yeah. Great. So um, part of part of our uh, show here is uh, to to mention some books we personally are reading. Are you? I know you're very busy, but are you reading <laughs> something right now? <laughs> or you know, say, yeah. I'm going to read you. I promise. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I just read a wonderful book that comes out in May um, by John Mualam, who doesn't. He's called a science writer. He he doesn't uh, think of himself. He just thinks of himself as a writer. Who sometimes writes about things in the realm of science and nature, but he's written this beautiful book called *Wild Ones*, which has to do with the, the history and science of, of endangered species and how we decide what to protect, how to protect, why, which ones, and just a lovely. I mean, he's just a beautiful writer, and so that's that's a wonderful. Uh, that's coming out in May, and I really enjoyed that. I I read it because I blurbed it, um, and I'm currently reading. A book that's coming. I'm always reading, <laughs> blurbing, but I have to yes, blurb. Yes. So um, I was just re I'm just started reading a book of, about behind the scenes in the world of shipping, which is a very kind of sort of secret. Thing. It's it's going on everywhere. Everything in our lives is shipped from. There's all the, you know going from place to place around the world. It's this sort of humming network that we don't really think about. And I love that. You know, anytime somebody pulls back the curtain on a little secret world, uh, it's fascinating. So that's a really interesting book. It's called Ninety Percent of Everything. Oh wow! Uh, as in, ninety percent of everything we have is shipped, uh, and it's by Rose George, who wrote that book on. Yeah, I yeah, just Rose. so I just put an article up on Scientific American about India drowning in its own excrement because I yes. got to visit India with the International yeah. Reporting Project. And she also just recently came out with a TED yeah. talk, so I thought perfect because yeah. I read that book, uh, The Big Necessity. Yes. Before, uh, before I went to India because I yeah. wanted to know. I wanted to be informed on the sanitary yes. conditions, and so it's yeah. very important. So I'm glad to hear this would be her third book, wouldn't it? So uh, yes, she wrote I one think on it refugees. is. Yes, refugees. She, refugees. She wrote one on refugees, I think. Refugee camps. Yeah. So then this about shipping. So. This uh, oh good yeah this yeah. is so, so anyways, exciting it's, it's it's lovely it's a, it's a wonderful book she's a beautiful writer I'm trying to think what um, what else am I uh, reading well those are the two I'm reading a book by Charlie Wilkins who's a, a Canadian writer who uh, he's now sixty he's sixty something and he participated and it was it was a, a, an attempt to break this the record for rowing across the Atlantic and he was um, he's a very f funny gifted writer and he was well out of his league I mean he was in really great shape for himself but you know there were former Olympic rowers and, and just a grueling experience uh, and that but that book when does that uh, and of course I'm forgetting what the name of it is but um, anyway I'm reading that too I think it comes out in the fall Okay, so that's a ways out. So, that's that's so yeah. exciting. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at things like that. These books that cover one topic and then open different facets about that topic. You know, I look at like Simon yeah. Winchester yeah. did that with Krakatoa, and then that just opened the door for everybody to start doing this. To yeah. my delight. Yes. And uh, I just finished a book by Dan Fagan called Tom's River. It's like science Ooh, and yes. salvation. And it was 
Okay. About uh, the Siba Geigy moving into New Jersey and what they decided to do with their chemical waste. So it was the process of chemistry and how you make dyes and then how does a corporation deal with all the waste Yeah, right. and how does that impact but then also how uh, it sort of looks into the epidemiology. How do we know something causes cancer? Can we know? Right. What are right. the statistics of disease? And you know I just I finished that one just recently and I really really enjoyed it. I'm reading uh, or listening on audio to a book called Rabid which looks at every single thing about rabies, oh, which wow. uh, is very, yeah. the history and everything, the, the way these books do these yeah, days, right. and um, it, it's very, very interesting. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, as, as this uh, project, Hangout Project continues, I get to talk to a lot more yeah. authors and uh, excited. Did you ever read that book, The Fruit Hunters, by no. Adam Gallner? That's one of those books that, I mean, you take something I mean, fruit doesn't sound like an inherently gripping <laughs> topic, but that is the most magical book. I mean, it's one of those books where you you know he steps into the world of people who who travel to the, these you know, corners of the globe trying to you know they're, they're basically collectors of weird fruit and also the breeding of fruit. And I mean, it's, there's nothing I can say that's going to get across how unbelievably gripping, magical that book is. It's just such an interesting, he's such a wonderful writer and he has almost this, just this childlike wonder and this, um, he's, he just falls into this world and, it, and is swept away and and goes in so many different directions and, and it's, I wanted that book to just be a huge, it's one of those things where you just, you, you want people, you want to tell people, I know it's about fruit, I know you think this is going to be dull. But uh, but it's 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 so interesting. So ah, well, uh, I've written that, it down now. I've written all your suggestions down because well, I'm always on the lookout for interesting and fun, and you know, yeah, uh, just, your reading helps inform you uh, right. what to write, how to write. Um, I also love the book uh, Cold by I think it was Streve. Is it is his last name Streve? Um, he's a biologist and he's up in Alaska. But it it just takes the topic yes. cold and. It, you know, he, he talked about historically about the, the 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 quest for absolute zero and the yes yes uh, people were like blowing themselves up in pursuit of this and and then all this stuff about this you know the, the what is it the sub subnevian world of like creatures that live not underground not above the ground but it, like in the grasses and in the frozen kind of detritus that's sort of just below the surface he talks it just he takes it to yeah you know, it, it just just the word cold, you know, whatever I think he sort of free associated in it, and, he, and, and whatever came came he to, to yeah, he so he, it's it's very wide ranging, but it's just again, fa everything you learn so much, and it's such fascinating material. Uh, that right. book is it was wonderful. Yeah. I, I've got this written down. I think I've seen that one though, actually. I don't think I've read yeah. it. Uh, yeah. there, you know, because there's books out there like on salt and ice and mm -hmm. skin, cod, cod. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the and and but that you could tell a historical uh, right. tale, you can tell a scientific tale, you cultural yeah. tale. Yeah. And it's interesting by by limiting yourself in some ways you open a lot of doors. I I find I'm more comfortable. I mean, I I I would think it'd be an interesting exercise if somebody give you what seems to be a very narrow topic and then just see how far by digging in and following Different tangents, how this is how how far you could go and the places it would take you that you would never expect to go, having that starting point. Two, no, three very memorable ones from recent years. I read one about moss, that was wow. all very a woman who had a. It was a very poetic but informative book. One about rats, who was a oh, guy yes, Robert rats. Sullivan, right? Yeah, he had, he rats. Journal in an alley in New York, and it yes. just expanded. And another one is. Um, Oh shoot! By by, you know, a Facebook friend. Uh, his book on the Beaufort scale. Oh, that's oh, Scott. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Scott Hewler. Scott Hewler. Uh, he's going to be a guest on here. Yes, is is an amazing work. It is informative and poetic, and that's what it's about. But it's yeah, it's one you pick up. Say, I cannot believe he wrote a book about the Beaufort scale. Yeah. 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 I mean, or that one. I I didn't read this, but Longitude. That's that's. Yeah. I just thought. How brilliant to, I mean, you look at globes and maps and you, you see these lines, but whoever had the idea 
to write a book about them. Well, Joanne uh, knows I'm a big fan of the longitude problem, so it's... <laughs> it was a that's great Davis Sobel, history. right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, it's so exciting. This, this is great. Mary, I want to thank you so much for taking time and <laughs> spending time with us, almost an hour of your time. Uh, oh, well, you're um, welcome. It was fun. And I just, the, I love the, the enthusiasm you guys have for bringing science to people that don't necessarily encounter it in their day to day lives and, and who may not realize that they like science. You know, that's yeah. what it's all about. That, that's what I always say about my website. I said, well, it, it seems to be for young people, but also for older people who maybe forgot they like science. Yeah. Like yeah. somewhere. But uh, And I think on top of it that Jeff and I are just such strong advocates for literacy in general, but also yeah. science literacy, that science yeah. is a great way to improve your skills. And, you know, and I even think when I look at, uh, you know, if you want to become a scientist, even if you yeah. don't, but if you want to become a scientist, what do you do most of the time? You read. You need yeah. that attention span. You need all those right. great things you get from reading. So yeah, for sure, yeah. And uh, so I'm going to say right now, actually, Mary Roach will be in Chicago on Monday Yay. evening at the Herald of Washington Library with Rebecca Sklute, who wrote uh, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. They will both be on stage, yeah. and I will be in the audience, trying not to be too geeky about the whole thing. Just so excited because it's a I'm great very character. Excited. Yeah, I'm excited, very excited too. She's a, a, a That book is extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So have yeah. you guys sat down and talked before then? Uh, I have met her uh, when she was in San Francisco a while back for the uh, book tour. I met her and um, we, uh, we we just talked on the phone about this event and how what we'll do. So. Good. I, well, I'm looking yeah. forward to it. I plan on being there unless, for some reason, the Midwest <laughs> has a snowstorm because it wants to. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I'm gonna. I'll drive up. It's not quite five hours, but. <laughs> oh, good. Good. I, I think feel it's only terrible two. about that. Oh, don't feel <laughs> terrible. I, I should I, drive five hours. Or... Drive five hours there and five hours back. But I got to spend all day with you. Yeah, and you true. know, in my mind, I imagine that you would just have people crawling all over you, begging to be sitting next to you. I mean, you did. You had people come up and say things and say really nice things, but I was just like, I'm hanging out with Mary Roach. This that is was super. funny. And, and who was, there was another convention. Was it the Coast Guard or oh, it was, the, uh, the, like, the emergency Ohio, preparedness? Or? Ohio Tactical Officers. That's I right. remember that. So there's all these guys <laughs> in their military gear. And How many parties did we get in? Invited to Mary, I don't know. Oh, it's uh, all a blur. <laughs> but that, yeah, it was it was a great great time. I'm yeah. really glad I did. I mean, you know, because I made a short list of people I wanted to meet. And you were on that list. Alan Alda's on that list, um, and I think you and Alan actually have similarity because when Alan talks to scientists, he's going to sit there and talk to them till he understands. Wait, Alan Alda? Yeah. So he did a TV oh. show a while ago called the guy uh, from Mash. Yeah, but oh, he oh. he did a t TV show a while ago called Scientific American Frontiers. It's no longer oh, on. Wow. But his job as that host was to go to labs and be his enthusiastic self and intelligent self, yeah. but a non-scientist who's sitting there saying, explain this to me. And then yeah, when yeah, yeah. he felt like when he finally understood it that there was material in that the general public could understand. Right. And that was the whole premise of the show. And so he's one of my heroes for actually doing that. And yeah. I see you do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, in a you know, a narrow focus for yeah, one yeah. book. Very fascinating material. But yeah. you're in there with the scientists saying, you know, I'm yeah. I'm here till I understand what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I, those poor people I I often say I use them like unpaid tutors. <laughs> like Okay, let's sit down. We're going to talk about cosmic radiation, and I don't know anything. I don't get it. I wonder if Help you get me. to write that on a scientific grant when you're requesting, you know, money. I was in Mary Roach's book, by the way. Yeah. You know. <laughs> oh, great. You know, here's. I survived <laughs> Mary Roach. <laughs> it's hardly an unpaid gig because they sit working in their laboratories and they get the satisfaction of their work, but they really secretly are hoping that someone, anyone, will come and ask them. Tell me something interesting. Yeah, that's right. And they, yeah, I mean, you know, because I don't, I don't know that you, being in your book, <laughs> the publicity from that amounts to anything for in a scientific endeavor. It makes oh, their yeah. university very proud. 
Mm. Yeah, you know, right. but I think you know they they're just probably thrilled to talk about their work, and I yeah. I expect that's what you find. Yeah, they, yeah, that's right. They wouldn't that's invite right. you yeah. in because their their spouse is not interested. The kids don't want to hear. About it. <laughs> not more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there we go. I can say thank you now. Thank you very much, Mary. Oh, thank you, Jeff. It's great to meet you. Thank you, Mary, and uh, I'll see you Monday. All right, I'll see you Monday. Okay. okay. All Great. right. Bye. And thanks to everybody out there who uh, watched all or part of this. And if you want to rewatch it, it will be on uh, one of my YouTube channels, whatever one that Google Plus said is connected. So I think it's Joanne Moss 7 is the one that it's on. But I'll put the link on all my social media. You can find it there. Uh, Jeff, as always, it's so wonderful to hang out with you. It's been fun. We've finally gotten things off to a great start with Mary. And uh, I'm looking forward to more of these conversations. Yes, in fact, there's one this Saturday at 4 p.m. Uh, Central. And that is with Brian Sweetek who wrote My Beloved Brontosaurus and with Daniel Loxton who has uh, Pterosaur Trouble which is a children's book about uh, pterosaurs that he illustrated and wrote himself. He also has other books. So uh, we'll be talking to two dinosaur fans who share their love with the general public and I can't wait for that one. I think and then this is probably about where we sign off by saying something That's right. like you know, goodbye from me and Joanna. Remember, read science. That's right. Remember to read science. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Right. See you later, Jeff. Okay. Bye, Joanne.